On behalf of the city of Greeley, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. My name is Benjamin Snow, and I serve as the Director of Economic Health and Housing. And just like we did in February, tonight is the second of two community meetings we're having this week. We met last night at a virtual meeting where we had about 40 people join us online, and some of you were there, so welcome back. Your input and feedback is really important in this process. The conversations this time around are going to focus on themes that emerged during the meetings in February, and we're also going to continue talking about the demand for local services um, and services here in our region. We're going to look at best practices used around Colorado and around the country. You're also going to have the opportunity to provide input on possible recommendations regarding homeless services, local coordination, and housing options. For the benefit of those who have not participated with us yet, I'm going to take just a few minutes to provide some context to the work that we're now in the middle of. The cities of Greeley and Evans have been responding to homeless and housing issues for many years in various ways. We continue to provide support for the current cold weather shelter, the Housing Navigation Center, and other nonprofit service providers who coordinate with each other as well as both of our cities all throughout the year to address these issues. Greeley held a city council work session on January the 25th to provide our elected leadership a status update on many of these same topics. That agenda, the meeting minutes, and the video can be accessed online for those who want to go backwards and uh, time and see that. And as just mentioned, we also had two community outreach sessions in February. We're going to have a couple this week, and we'll also have a couple of more in June. These community outreach events are part of the city's efforts to consider a longer-term response to homelessness. Back in 2020, in the early days of the pandemic, city staff of both Greeley and Evans, along with our nonprofits, came together to begin looking at how other communities are grappling with this same challenge. This included examining other city models and responses, including the pros and cons of having a possible campus where some of the community services and housing options can be consolidated. About five months ago, we hired Urbanity to help determine how we can best proceed on temporary sheltering and affordable housing options in the future. The scope of this project includes evaluating current homeless and housing data, analyzing demand for temporary shelters and permanent housing, and estimating capital and operating costs associated with different options. Additionally, the process includes having wider community conversations and outreach to engage with all of you. Tonight, Urbanity will share what we have learned to date. I'd also like to recognize Heather Balzer. You saw her out in the hallway there. She's the city's interim chief resiliency officer, and she's also serving as our project manager. So thank you, Heather, for playing such a key role in this project. I'd now like to turn some things, some time over to Urbanity, and uh, there are our consultant on this project, and then James and his team will take it from here. Cool. Thanks, Ben. My, I'm James Roy, I'm the founder of Urbanity Advisors. I uh, started it in 2015. Uh, I also run a nonprofit in Denver called Denver Metro Community Impact. It uh, la launched in 2017, and uh, so I run both of those organizations um, and have a a deep passion for cultivating equity through the tools of urban planning and and uh, and community work, really community engagement. Um, so this has you know been a really exciting time for me, and I, I also used to live in Greeley for a little bit. Um, well, I think I moved up here in 2004 for college. Didn't get much coursework done, but uh, yeah, I was here. I worked at the Olive Garden. It was cool. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, let's see. So the first thing I, I want to do is let you know this is a this is a interactive presentation. For those of you that were here last time or here or, you know or on the meeting last night, you know that uh, there are some interactive questions that happen throughout this presentation, and this is one of the methods that we're utilizing to uh, collect input. Uh, we started last night with a quiz, a little quiz question. And I'm, as soon as I hit start quiz, it's going to have a timer of, a, I believe, 30 seconds. 
but you'll see the question and you can answer it. And those of you that uh, uh, were a part of this last night, you know, you got the answer already. So <laughs> here we go. The starts in as soon as that thing is done. Oh, yeah. In the 1920s, Greeley supplied the, a quarter of the supply for this product in the United States. So feel free to vote or shout it out if you want. You say corn? We've got some sugar. Anybody vote on, on, the, on the slides? Nobody's voting on the slide. It's okay. You did? Why is it not showing up? That's weird. Oh, there we go. Nope. Oh, maybe it's because I get it now. It's because we weren't, we weren't finished yet. <laughs> All right. So the, the number one answer is sugar, and that is the correct answer. But, um, that's from uh, Beats, is what I heard last night. I had no idea. I thought that was a pretty cool question. Um, okay, so that was just to you know, warm you guys up and show you this interactive feature. Going on to the next slide. Uh, were you involved in the February conversations as I trip over everything? <clears throat> We've got some yeses. On the screen, we've got 67% uh, saying yes out of 15 votes and 33%, 38% saying no. Well, that no is growing. We've got 41. 44. Yeah, this is, this is helpful for uh, understanding what we need to uh, um, present, of course, on the introduction side of things. So. Uh, we've got a lot of a lot of folks that are, are new to uh, the process tonight. Is there, by a show of hands, was there anyone that was on a meeting last night? Got two, two to four. Okay, we got four people. Okay, cool, cool. So you guys know what's about to happen. <laughs> Except today, I'm going to be a little bit faster, and I'm already not. So uh, this slide, I want you to choose a a. Uh, section on this map that uh, you identify as your community. So we've got some, some dots near downtown, West Greeley, got some south of Highway 34. Got nine votes on this so far. I wish those dots were standing out on this map a little bit more. Hopefully you can see that okay. Got some folks around UNC Garden City just popped up a dot. Cool. I think this is always helpful to really, you know, as we're going into a conversation and knowing, knowing what we're, you know, who we're in the room with and, and uh, what we're, uh, you know, what the context is. So moving on to the next slide, I believe this is the last interactive slide for this section. Have you ever experienced housing insecurity? And so the main things that we're talking about here is homelessness and housing affordability problems. All right, so just to give you guys uh, some context about what we're doing, Urbanity Advisors, we are under a scope of work with the city of Greeley to uh, evaluate the existing sources of information, analyze what might be driving the demand locally and regionally, uh, around homelessness, evaluate best practices around the country and the state, provide opportunities for engagement and public involvement like tonight, uh, estimate development and ongoing operating costs of whatever might be proposed and recommended, and then outline a financial feasibility plan, funding options, and key next steps would be the last uh, task on that. Um, you know, I already gave a little bit of, about uh, Urbanity Advisors. I formed it in 2015. Got some cool clients that uh, we've worked with, uh, you know, urban planning services, and then we've got we've got three really awesome uh, other LLCs that uh, I team up with quite often that are in this room as well. Um, and yeah, we're, this is our passion. This is what we do, and we're really excited about it. This is what the the faces of everybody that's working on this project look like. Last night I went through us one by one and. Wasted a lot of time, so I'm not going to do that tonight. But you can see there. Um, 
project framing. So th this, uh, this slide is actually a little outdated, but I think I'm still going to go over it. Uh, this was from the first presentation. The current stage that uh, we, or the stage that we were in on the last uh, meeting was evaluate the existing sources of information. And that was really doing that community, community engagement work, talking to stakeholders uh, and partners that are, are working within homelessness around Weld County and Greeley and Evans and Garden City, of course. Um, and to really, really just study everything that was going on here and get the, the current context of everything. And so that's what we'll be talking about in a little bit here. But we really wanted to understand what the plans were and, uh, of course, some of those best practices like we talked about. And so what have we learned so far? That's the next section of our, of our uh, presentation here. First, we're going to talk about the stakeholder interviews. We have a, um, a team member with a, or, uh, that's not here tonight. Her name is uh, Terrell. She uh, did 13 interviews of stakeholders in Greeley and, and Evans and interviewed them for about an hour uh, between January 9th and February 17th. And what we've put together is a, a, a SWOT analysis, which stands for uh, strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, to really talk about and, and, and summarize what we learned by talking with uh, stakeholders that were working in, the, uh, in this area. On the strengths column here, we recognized a strong passion for change. It was just passion for this work. Uh, strong skills and expertise. There's um, you know, also the, uh, the opportunity that Northern Colorado Continuum of Care uh, brings to the uh, to Weld and Larimer County. Uh, it's just a, a tremendous opportunity. A lot of things that that uh, I'll talk about later. There, uh, there's a lot of great ideas in motion. High Plains Housing Development Corp has some ideas and uh, and, a, and a site uh, secured. Uh, there's also 665 units in the pipeline. Uh, those are in various stages of whether or not they are actually going to be built. But those are these are 665 units that have been identified that we learned from stakeholder interviews. Uh, some of the weaknesses that we uh, noticed that there was some siloed conditions, uh, meaning there wasn't there was some instances where there was not much communication going on between different organizations or different departments, even different uh, um, government entities, and and so on, and so that led to some poor communication some gaps and duplication in services that exist. And, um, and then all, lastly, that we learned of uh, a lack of quality engagement uh, from those that are experiencing homeless, homelessness. And so we really want to make sure that we open up opportunities in the future to talk with uh, folks that have experienced homelessness. And I think we, you know, with our, our last uh, couple of meetings, I'll show some of the results of that, we had, uh, people that had experienced, uh, had lived experience around that. And I just want to, again, stress the importance of, of making sure we connect with the homeless community so that we can create solutions together and, uh, and really understand what's going on there. From an opportunities standpoint, I really believe this is where things shine. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong desire to coordinate. Now, I talked about in the weaknesses, there's poor coordination, but there's a really strong desire to, there's a, uh, a desire to engage the, the homeless community, a desire to engage the community at large, and that's what we're doing right now, and we're going to keep on improving that. Uh, and then, you know, I highlighted the opportunity of what United Way of Weld County brings to uh, just existing and being here. They are a, a uh, you know, a national organization that has, has done a lot of really great work and system-level coordination around collective impact leadership, which is some of the things that solve the, uh, the weaknesses that we're talking about here. And I'll get more into that later. Some of the threats that uh, we heard from in these interviews were disengagement uh, at the county level. And there's some debate about whether or not that is true or not. And I think it's always about making sure we are, we're ready to talk and invite everyone to the table so that we can create solutions together. Uh, we also heard about territorial behavior, passive aggressive behavior. And, uh, and the threat of, nim of nimbyism, which is, uh, stands for not in my backyard, which uh, of course is, I, I know there's probably a lot of folks that are familiar with that term in this room, but when folks um, 
really don't want the solution for the problem to be in their backyard. Um, so, you know, just to summarize that up, that's, that's what we learned from the uh, stakeholder interviews and it's really, really good stuff for our, uh, our report that we're building out here. Oh, siloed. Oh, there we go. Yeah, siloed conditions. So that was, uh, we're referring to um, organizations not uh, communicating uh, across, across organizations and across departments sometimes and making sure that uh, those connections remain open and, and collaborative. So that's what we we're talking about with siloed conditions. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the, we, um, in working with uh, the city, there were a number, like uh, Ben, and as Ben introduced, there was a number of, uh, of folks that have, uh, have been working on homelessness from, a, from shelters to housing to services that, uh, that we had a list of. And we called and emailed and, and scheduled interviews with everyone that we could. Um, and that was, that's how we formed out the stakeholder interviews right there. And the next uh, thing, so I'm, uh, we'll get into the community conversations pretty soon here, but the uh, next thing I want to talk about is the, the continuum of care, the Northern Colorado continuum of care. Um, it's a, a funding that comes through HUD uh, that's uh, purpose to rehouse individuals, families, and minimize the trauma of homelessness and, that, and the reentry into homes. Uh, it also includes the point in time count, which is a night that uh, where uh, everyone that is in a shelter, or in some cases uh, uh, every other year unsheltered, is counted and uh, as a, a demographic there. And so we utilize the PIT count uh, to also, of course, bolster what we've been learning uh, in the community. And from that, one of the things that uh, you know, and and one thing that we learned last night as Kelly, I don't know if Kelly's in the audience today, uh, that runs, uh, obviously not, but runs uh, the continuum of care. She said there's some updated data that's coming out. So this is, this is data from January 2020. And soon we'll have uh, fresh data from this year that will, obviously things have changed since 2020. And I think we'll have some, some really good, you know, Good, good context to move forward with. But in, the, in January 2020, 240 people were counted in, in shelters and in transitional housing. 176 in shelters, 64 in transitional housing. Now, well, this graph right here, what it's showing, and I know that it's not uh, very visible on the screen from this length, but there's a, there's a real big problem around what that looks like from an age standpoint. And 37% of homelessness in uh, Weld County is under the age of 24. And so when you think about just how young homelessness here is here, that's, that's a problem. But I think it's also there's some opportunity to think about and, the, and what we can do and what the hope is in looking at this and, and seeing that we can, we can reach the youth. 30% of, of, uh, of those folks under 24 are actually 17 and under. That's 30% of the homelessness that was counted under the age of 17. Uh, the numbers have gone up. I, I, you said it was. Uh, you said some numbers there. I'll make sure that we get the uh, the the um, the data as soon as it comes out and send that out to folks. But uh, yeah, youth is a is a huge problem in homelessness here, and that, I think it's a it's a strong um, it's a sad thing, but it's also Something for hope. Um, on the, I also, we also broke down what uh, it looks like from a race and ethnicity standpoint. Uh, the PIT count in 2020 showed that 55% uh, of homelessness in Weld County is uh, Hispanic or Latinx, uh, with about 27% uh, being white, and the, the rest of that uh, mix of races. Uh, the overall population of Weld County is on the graph, is on the uh, other side here. We've got about 30% Hispanic or Latinx and uh, around 63% white. And so when we think about you know, that from an equity standpoint and, and how we really address this problem, we've we got to really you know, start to analyze these types of things. It's not something that we've you know, arrived on a conclusion within our report on, on any recommendations here, but it's, 
something that I think is important to show on the, the dynamics of, of homelessness. Um, now we can get into our, uh, our community voice work that was done. So we had the two community conversations in February that uh, some of you were at. And then we also had an online survey for, the, for folks that weren't able to make that uh, meeting. We also will have a survey that will resemble this meeting as well for, for folks that are not able to uh, make it tonight or last night. Um, and on February 16th, 68 participants were in attendance, 39 on the 17th, 72 on the survey. And uh, one of the things that we, you know, we made sure we, we tracked in this was what people's perception of homelessness uh, was in, in Greeley and Weld County, what the uh, impact to their own lives, their personal experience might be, and then lastly, what the vision of success looks like to uh, change the trajectory and to, and to talk about what the future could be around uh, homelessness and the services that uh, can go along with it. Um, so first I'll talk about that perception side of things. We'll, I'll make sure I send out this, uh, this slide to everyone that's in attendance here. The, obviously the, the text on the uh, graphs is pretty small. Uh, but in per, on the perception side of things, we noticed that um, after you know, crunching through our data, and turning it into qualitative data, uh, there were four top things that, that came out. One, that it's a growing problem. It's a housing problem. It's a mental health and substance abuse problem. And lastly, it's a safety problem. So those were the, the top four things expressed around the perception of uh, homelessness within uh, Weld County. Um, from, from an impact standpoint, like I said, this is, we ask people to really think about how this impacts their, their, their lives, their families. Um, and the top three things under impact were through lived experience. So those are folks that uh, have have had the, you know, the pro, you know, experienced problems with housing affordability or homelessness. And then uh, observational and visual, so that, those were people that were saying you know, they see the problem, they see it increasing. Uh, you know, there were different things that went along with what they were seeing there, but the observational and visual impact was something that we measured. Uh, and then lastly, the, the last most frequent remark was that they work with the homeless on a daily basis. So we had a lot of practitioners in the room working with and working to solve the problems that we're talking about today. Uh, from a, a side, that, I mean, from going to the, the vision for the future, uh, uh, the top three things were, uh, that were proposed were housing solutions, more resources, and better collaboration or coordination between organizations and uh, and, and government, of course. So that, that wraps up the, uh, uh, actually, and I just want to say uh, on all of these slides, uh, the top graph was the uh, community conversations, the bottom was the online survey, and it measured frequency of what was mentioned in those, uh, those categories there. So now <clears throat> we're going into really the meat of what this meeting is all about exploring the how. And for many of you that were uh, involved in the last meeting, we, I talked about how um, the first meeting was about defining the why. What's going on, the current conditions, why are we here, how do we get, how do we start addressing the issues? And so what we're gonna talk about in this next part of the presentation is some of those best practices that we've seen, some of the work that's been done in other places, uh, and how that could be adapted to Greeley because not every, every solution doesn't just, you know, you can't just stick a Band-Aid and, and make it work somewhere else. So we've got to really think about what, what works here, what works for the community, what works for, uh, you know, this context. Um, so, and, and after this, this part of the presentation, we're going to break out into small groups so that everyone gets a chance to talk and, uh, and share those ideas like Phil is talking about here so that we can record the, that, uh, that, that data and work it into our report. So thank you so much once again, Phil. Uh, so one of, the, one of the top themes that we talked about in the, that last section was better coordination and collaboration. The Collective Impact Framework, which is a, a, a framework that uh, has been around for about, a, about 12 years, 
uh, is a, it's it really, uh, I'll, I'll just read this statement because I was about to fumble it here. The collective impact is a network of community members, organizations, and institutions who advance equity by learning together, aligning, and integrating their actions to achieve population and systems level change. So that's when all the, all different, a lot of different organizations come together and agree that they want to solve a problem together. They're going to share resources to solve this problem, share data to solve the problem, and agree how to walk forward on, on, uh, on making it happen. You don't have to agree on every single part of the, of the problem, but at least agree that we can do better. And that's what collective impact is, is all based around. And you know, I talked about United Way earlier in this uh, presentation. United Way is, is uh, like I said, a national presence that has been one of the biggest adopters and leaders of collective impact across the nation. They haven't been able to, uh, to do that in Weld County because of, they've been really busy with, uh, with direct impact, with really go, you know, doing the work and providing, uh, providing resources. But one of their strongest skills and, uh, is just this, collective impact. And so you know, I think that from that opportunity, we're really starting to, starting to explore how can we rally around what's already here? How can we make sure that we strengthen the partnerships and the, and the engagement and the community and all the organizations through something like Collective Impact? Um, then, of course, in, a, in addressing the housing solutions and resources, we've, kept, we've uh, taken a look at uh, creative innovations, alternatives, and solutions. And uh, by that, I mean that we've, we've looked at some campus-style approaches that really bring, to, uh, bring together uh, looking at um, bring housing and resources and services and, into one location so that people can, uh, so that uh, you know, those experiencing housing insecurity can really come to one place and, and feel you know, welcomed and, of course, uh, treated in, in many different ways there. Uh, we're also going to look at... Uh, Temporary housing interventions. There, there was a lot of folks in the last series of meetings that mentioned tiny homes, um, and then uh, some monitored tent encampments so that they're not just scattered in, in certain places, and that also can lead to uh, some resource deployment. But of course, those are temporary solutions there that don't uh, usually provide, uh, you know, that long-term impact. Um, and then we also are going to look at what you know, scattered site, and I meant to write a longer sentence here, I actually said the same thing last night, but that uh, really going to where the problem exists and, and being able to bring solution services resources uh, to, to the to homeless uh, community wherever they are. And so and, uh, it's also not exclusive in any one of these categories. We can, of course, work on all three. But that's something that we're going to talk about tonight in our small groups. We've got about five minutes before we break it out into groups here, so I'm going to go a little bit faster. Um, the uh, first one that we're going to talk about is a Royal Village. This is a uh, Denver development that actually our, one of our teammates, uh, Terrell, who we talked about, did, did the uh, stakeholder interviews. She was the executive director of uh, the Dolores Project when this was developed. Um, and it, in partnership with Rocky Mountain Communities, which I was on the board of at the time as well, too. And through that, we uh, developed a uh, mixed-use uh, property that uh, is, it brings in a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different elements, but it's trauma-informed. It provides 35 units of, perform of permanent supportive housing, which is the housing that comes along with services and, and treatment and other things. Um, and then also 95 units of, of uh, affordable housing that are there as well. And this, uh, this is a project that uh, Terrell's very proud of. I haven't actually been able to see much of it since it uh, opened, but really cool to see that uh, it, you know, we can use this as an example and, and see, if it's, see if it fits in the context of Greeley. So there's our, there are different tiers of affordable housing within this development here. There are some that are, are targeted at 30% AMI, area median income which is uh, labeled as transitional housing, and that is targeted straight towards folks that are coming out of homelessness. And then there's also, I think there was some 60% AMI uh, uh, properties in there, or, or uh, units in there as well, uh, that are more, uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit of a different bracket, those that are kind of 
moving out of maybe even the 30% transitional housing into something, uh, you know, something higher for them. So, and that's, that's something I wasn't prepared to talk about, so, but I really thank, uh, thank you for bringing that question up. I, heard, I learned about this, uh, this situation through United Way, actually, well, through Lyle Smith Gray, um, Grayball at uh, United Way. This was, they went and visited Santa Rosa, California, where uh, there's a really awesome housing first strategy uh, that they're working through right now. It involves uh, street outreach and engagement uh, the coordinated entry and the housing and supportive services that we talked about, but really the the uh, the most creative stuff that's going on with this is what um, is what's on this this side right here. Through that, you know, they're pro providing services around emergency shelter. Uh, they have some day services that where folks can come and and uh, use computers. Uh, really, you know, uh, I, I had some good notes here, and I'm. Feel like I'm messing that up, but uh, and then there's also a homeless services center that had uh, showers, laundry, telephone service, mail service, uh, referrals, and shelter intake, and just a, a whole lot of resources to really uh, to navigate. There's a, a, a place called the Living Room that was also in that uh, in that day service that's strictly for women and children experiencing homelessness and uh, providing a very safe space. Uh, for them to, uh, to, you know, be. Um, and then there's rental assistance program. Oh, yeah, the, I skipped one. The Safe Parking Lot Pilot Program. This was uh, designed to give that monitored tent camping environment or, and or, you know, for folks that might be living out of their cars to uh, be in a safe place that is monitored, has, uh, you know, different navigators that are coming around and, and connecting with the homeless and telling them, uh, giving them encouragement, giving them resources, and really changing the, the uh, narrative there. Um, on, there's also rental assistance programs for those that might be, you know, that paycheck away from being homeless and what, uh, you know, being able to be responsive around that. There's a community homeless assistance program. I forget what that one was all about. And then there's a homeless encampment assistance. This was, this was where the navigators actually not only were, you know, going to the safe parking lot, but also going to where folks were camping and connecting with them and being a, a point of contact uh, wherever they could be. And then lastly, there was a, uh, there's a warming center for any time that there, there were uh, weather events, whether it's rain, snow, uh, I guess probably not snow in Santa Rosa, but uh, <laughs> you get the point on that one. Lastly, uh, just talking about the uh, Bridge of Hope Center, in Richmond, California. This was a, uh, developed by the Bay Area Rescue Mission. Another trauma-informed uh, uh, development with long-term house, affordable housing at 26 units. I'm not sure what, the, uh, what the, a, the AMI breakup is on that one. But there was, there's also an emergency shelter at uh, this property with 114 shelter beds. Now, the three uh, examples I just talked to you about, that is far from the uh, exhaustive list that we've been looking at. But something to give you, you know, get the conversation going for tonight. And something that uh, hopefully as we talk uh, in, our, in our small groups, we can learn more from you and look and, and research even, even further about uh, what kind of recommendations could be made for, for Greeley. And also with the context of, of uh, what's going on in Greeley. So the next thing we're going to do, and I think we're almost right on time, a little, bit, little late. I'm doing better. Um, we're going to have our community conversation. We're going to break out into, into our small groups, and the, we're, we're going to have a conversation based around these four-ish questions. How can we promote better collaboration in Greeley? Um, could a real estate uh, facility solution address this issue? And if so, what services do you want to see in this potential future building? And then uh, last question is, how could uh, pr proposed solutions interact with the surrounding community? And where should they be located? So that last question I really think is, is really important for how, how is this gonna, going to fit in the context of Greeley? And we really need to, to learn that to make you know, the right recommendations there. So uh, before we break up into those groups, I'll always go over some ground rules. Uh, 
tonight this is about having, a, having good conversation. We're going to listen, respect, and assume good intentions of everyone that's speaking. And allow others to speak and wait. Don't interrupt. State your name when you're speaking and, and be able to, uh, of course, use each other's names. Uh, we're going to seek first to understand and not be understood and ask questions when, you're, when uh, you know, the uh, understanding might be loose. Um, and then we also got to understand this is, a, this is a, con a conversation, a public conversation, not a debate. We're not uh, here to uh, debate issues. So share what you feel, share what, you, uh, what your experience is, but uh, let's keep it respectful, of course. And then lastly, uh, what I'd like to do is ask the permission for our facilitators to, uh, to interrupt for uh, time and inclusion purposes. So if someone's getting a little long-winded, our facilitators are going to say, hey, you know, let's uh, let someone else speak for a second. <laughs> so we, if, do we have the permission for that? Is that cool? I think it's always a... Uh, a good sign when you feel like you could have had this conversation for a lot longer. I had a really great talk with, uh, with my folks over here. Um, it's really good stuff. Oops. Okay, so we've got about uh, eight minutes left, and we're going to uh, kind of work through kind of what we, you know, what we learned and everything. The first thing I, w you know, is I want everyone to do is pull out your interactive device stuff again and uh, in one word um, describe how your conversation felt um, or, or went uh, whatever you would use to describe the conversation purposeful engaging honest after we're done with these we're gonna I'm gonna allow um, have uh, Amy walk around with the microphone and hear uh, some short remarks about uh, how these conversations went. Of course, we're running out of time here, so we've got to keep it uh, a little concise. Uh, but here we go. We've got productive, involved, helpful, positive, purposeful, knowledge, knowledgeable, collaborative, inquisitive, thoughtful, uh, compassion, productive, helpful, Engaging. I always like seeing re these really positive terms come through after having a conversation like this. It means it went well. Um, but you know, from our conversation, I'll just kind of model what uh, you, you, what uh, we'd like to share out here. You know, we, my group was uh, really talking about, you know, from the, the the perspective of collaboration, having a a point and a lead that can really kind of bring things together and uh, make sure that we can agree on, on uh, a common goal and a common way to move forward on things. Um, we also talked, you know, one of the last things that, uh, that came up was re really respecting the choices of, uh, of, of some of the, the folks that have been um, kind of ostracized in some ways in saying that they've chosen homelessness and that they should still have dignity for that choice that maybe they're not ready, but to be able to have the touch points that allow them to eventually be encouraged by becoming housed. And what a, a facility might be able to do to encourage that when you see your friends getting housed and your, and, uh, your peers and everything, and the, and the desire starts to increase. And that, the dignity of that choice can be uh, made there. Um, so I'll, I'll end with that. We had a lot more that we talked about. It was really, really great. I'd love to hear from other folks on what they're, you know, what they uh, talked about and whatever you want to share right now. Uh, my name's Dan Burmeister. I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of our group other than to just say, you know, the encouragement that I would take away from this discussion is, you know, passionate people who, you know, care about this topic and want to work towards a, um, a solution. You know, we talked similarly about, you know, kind of collaboration and you know making information available and transparent and easily accessible and then you know we had lots of discussion about kind of understanding 
the needs that the needs of the demographic that you said is it's uh, below 18 might be different than the need of you know someone in a different age demographic that you know we need to understand those needs before we actually go to solution but a whole range of solutions whether it's a campus model that that intuitively brings all these groups together and maybe somewhat forces collaboration is you know a positive but then also the notion of going to where the need is and a mobile unit might be another solution so we, we talked about a lot a lot of things all positive all caring all compassionate and very proactive so good discussion thanks Dave. steve wants to say something i'm going to uh, also put the questions, the final questions up as we're talking here, as Steve uh, is talking. Okay, uh, something that probably wasn't brought up to any of our, our group, it wasn't, but uh, <coughs> transportation transit is very important and, and also it, it uh, as well as influences where we live in the city as well. A lot of times you can't afford housing in the first place, but when you don't have transit or transportation close enough, how are you going to get to your doctor or work or whatever, or just have a life? So uh, something else to think about as well. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say, Amy. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> Anybody else want to share? I just have a quick question. I wanted to know about what's happening to Bonnell. Oh, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> Steve's got an answer? Cool. I understand um, the shelter for the elderly and disabled um, was there too, compliments of the Bonnell and the Good Samaritan. Um, and for the uh, people that were homeless uh, last year. And that, that is um, uh, for about a year, and they had to be out December 31st. Well, um, and then the residents had to be out there the first part of March. They only gave them two months to get out. What I've also understand is they're going to destroy the building, and then they're going to put quote affordable housing. Uh, I better keep my sarcasm out of this. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's what uh, was uh, uh, information that I got. I talked to twice to the uh, administrator, and uh, he didn't give me much information. Uh, more, but I uh, think it, what happened, I don't think the pe people that bought that place really cared about the people, and and if it's, uh, and I don't think it's going to be affordable either. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, this, this slide that's up um, is to prioritize the resources. You have 100 points to assign between these five. This is not exhaustive, of course. This, I just want to kind of show what people are thinking here. So if you feel like all of these are equally important, you would put 20 points on each one. If you think one is more important than the other, you would put more points on it and then the rest on the others. Um, so you assign 100 points to those. But uh, we had a question up here, Amy, and then we're, um, we are exactly at 7.30, so we'll get uh, your, co you'll, your question will be the last one, or comment or remarks. <laughs> uh, just sort of a comment, I guess. I happened to be watching the news. It was one of those, I think, public broadcasting station things from the uh, United Nations. Um, they have like the World Health Organization, World Meteorological Organization, all that kind of thing. Anyway, they had some statistics up there, and they said out of the 8 billion people on the planet, almost 10% of them are in some form of migration. They're on the move. They're going from Africa to uh, Europe or Latin America to North America or various very things. Uh, Greeley probably will not be able to be a, an island solving these problems. It's going to be a lot bigger collaboration than probably any of us imagine. Yeah, that's a really good point. Collaboration is, seems to be a you know, big theme of everything that we're talking about here. So thanks so much for sharing. What was your name, by the way? Ed. Ed, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed Grant. Oh, really? Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. So just in the spirit of, of making sure we're not conveying misinformation about Bunnell, <laughs> um, I, I need to let everybody know we have been in contact, the city, both my department, economic uh, development, um, as well as the community development. And the group that has purchased that facility 
Um, it's true that, that, that we had a wonderful run. We had a 14-month run, high success rate of people moving uh, from homeless conditions into housing, about 40%, in fact. So that's all really good. We're very happy. We have warm feelings in our heart towards Good Sam, towards Sanford. Um, but the, the new owners have also had conversations with the city, and we have housing needs all throughout the city along the entire strata of income levels. And so the facility is not going to be torn down and scraped. <laughs> the facility will be repurposed. It will be meeting needs of different rungs on our housing ladder here, and it's all good. So our office does work with a lot of developers of all stripes, of all income levels, and I just wanted to clarify for the record, for anybody who's listening, that the outcome at Bunnell um, is going to be a net positive for the community, so. Thank you, Ben. All right, that is good news. Um, so, you know, uh, oops, it's on the right side, okay. Uh, looks like, you know, we've got this breakdown here, housing, Ranking is number one, mental health services, number two, substance abuse, three, overnight shelter at, at uh, four, and workforce development at five. Uh, and that is actually exactly how it was last night, if I remember correctly. That's, that's interesting. That's cool. Um, that wraps up the presentation. Actually, there was one other question here, but last night I uh, realized that it's kind of limited. Uh, but we could still answer this if you'd like. But how would you like to see these resources coordinated? We have a centralized campus, the mixed, uh, the, you know, the campus model, and we have the scattered site, meet people everywhere. But we don't have a, a both, because this doesn't have to be exclusive. And so this question, this slide right here, I feel like is very limiting, and I apologize for that. But uh, I think, um, you know, just from the, the conversations that we've had tonight and, and what's occurred here, th this is really, really positive and really good. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with, with everybody in the room and, and, uh, and, and see the changes that we can make in, in people's lives that are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. So thank you for your time.